Hello and welcome to Grief Seeds, a podcast where you'll find insights, reframings, metaphors, and visualizations, all known as Grief Seeds, to help you cultivate growth and healing in your life after loss. My name is Shelby Forsythia. I'm an intuitive grief guide and author, and on this show, I'll share insights from my interactions with clients, wise words from fellow grievers, and personal stories from my own life with the hope that they transform your grief as they have transformed mine. Because even when it doesn't feel like it, we are planting the seeds of growth in the midst of great pain and heartache. Your grief is welcome here. Hi there, grief growers. Thank you so much for being here with me today. This one might turn everything you knew about grief and isolation upside down. So I was working with a client uh, a few weeks ago and she has suffered some devastating losses, including the loss of a parent and now the loss of a very, very, very dear friend. And what kept coming out of her mouth during our sessions was, I want to be at home. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to see anybody. And even jokingly, but kind of not jokingly, I'm sure a lot of uh, grieving people can resonate with this, I hate everything and everyone, which is a, a very real sentiment. It's, it's we don't want to allow anybody into our bubble unless they know what grief is like. And even then, it is exhausting to create, a, drum up energy to be in public spaces and to be around people other than ourselves, and sometimes, if we're lucky, our pets. And she was kind of whirling around this idea for a little bit, that the idea of hating everything and everyone, or not really wanting to go anywhere, or not really wanting to see anybody might be wrong or bad. And this is a thought I've had about myself and my grief. I have sat alone in my respective apartments in my respective different cities around the country asking, is it bad that I am so alone? Statistically, isolation is the number one experience reported by grieving people. And of course, yes, there is despair and agony and aching and longing in the experience of feeling so alone in your grief. So I want to validate all of that to be true before I say what I have to say today. So I looked at my client over Zoom, this is a Zoom session, and I said, what if all of these things you're telling yourself about not wanting to see people, about only wanting to stay at home, about kind of keeping yourself at an arm's length from everything and everyone, what if it was not forced isolation or the despair or agony of being alone, but instead your body's way, your grief's way, your heart's way? of telling you, I need so much protection right now. This is the way I know to keep myself safe when everything has fallen apart. This is the way that I know to heal when nothing is stable anymore. I stay within four walls that I know. I wear clothes that are familiar to me. I see only myself in the mirror or only the people in my pod or in my bubble who I'm intimately familiar with or my pets. I only consume media or content that I've seen before. Movies, books, podcasts, radio. Yes, art, experiences. I live in a place that is soft and protected and guarded from the outside world. I want to share a little piece of um, etymology with you because if you haven't noticed by now (laughs) in this third full-length episode of Grief Seeds, I'm a little obsessed with words and how they change our grief experience. So there's this word, uh, comfort, that exists in the English language and in so many other languages. And the roots of the word comfort are together or with, com, C-O-M, and fort, which means strong. And you would think that to comfort somebody, to be strong together, is to empower them, to make them feel better. And even now when we think about comforting people who are grieving in the aftermath of a loss, we think about 
bringing them out of the pain or out of the situation that they are currently in that is causing them so much despair. But if you look at the traditional roots of the etymology of the word comfort, fort especially, is also the root word for fortress, as in a wall or a guarding place that protects a kingdom, that protects something very precious, that is built to shore up something that is vulnerable. So what if to comfort was not to make feel better, to rescue from pain, to save, or to even make laugh in the midst of despair, but to literally be strong together, to shore up alongside, to come beside as a partner, as a friend, as a witness, to protect in the midst of a season of great vulnerability. I think there's this fear sometimes that grieving people have that I am isolating too much, something is wrong with me. I'm spending too much time alone and it's bad for me. And this may be true. This may be true for you, especially if you find yourself slipping into an especially dark place, if you find yourself having ruminating thoughts about death or dying or the loss that you faced or these stories of not belonging or not being wanted or not being loved. Yes, there is darkness absolutely in isolation. And also, in the aftermath of loss, there is a kind of wisdom in it, like an injured animal that crawls away to lick its wounds. You don't see injured animals in the center of the room, the life of the party. You see them in a corner, resting on some comfortable knitted pad with pillows, licking their wounds, sleeping a lot, emerging to eat, and then going back to rest. It's okay if in your isolation, you treat yourself like this injured animal. Because everything in the world around you, everything that you used to know to be true is now gone. The world outside of your space, your four walls, yourself, everything has changed. A trip to the grocery store is no longer simply a trip to the grocery store. A walk around the block is no longer a walk around the block. Doing work to meet a deadline in whatever profession you're in is no longer just doing work to meet a deadline. Everything is saturated with grief, so it makes sense that isolation might be a go-to for you in grief. And instead of heaping all this shame on top of yourself about being alone, about making no progress, about being stuck where you are, about living the same day, day after day after day, with the same grief story, What if you reframed this as a season of protection? This time of isolation, this need for space, this need to be with yourself in a room or in a home that feels safe and guarded is a season of protection. And while it may look like there's nothing much happening on the outside, externally in your world, your heart and your mind, and if you believe it, your spirit, are racing to make sense of the grief experience that you have just survived and are actively surviving. That calls for a great deal of protection and a great deal of mercy. And if four sturdy walls and not answering the phone and watching the same thing on Netflix over and over and over again and lying horizontal on the couch allows your heart and mind and spirit to do all that processing, please allow it. Please let it be your truth. Let this protection be where you need to be right now. Knowing with some certainty that it is not where you will be all the time, But in the aftermath of this loss, in this season of grief, whether it is a fresh grief for you or you are in a season of re-grieving, grieving again, that protection is an okay and acceptable and respectable choice to make for yourself. It is an okay and normal way to serve and honor yourself 
in your grief. I invite you to take a deep breath with me here. And out. As you isolate yourself in your grief, as you put distance between places you used to go, people you used to see, and even actions that you used to take, know that there is nothing inherently wrong in needing space, in needing isolation, in needing room to process in the aftermath of loss. There is no shame in stepping away from the routines and from the people and from the locations that you used to know, that you used to frequent in order to protect yourself and your body and your heart and your mind and your spirit in the aftermath of loss. You are not punishing yourself in isolation. You are not reverting or slipping backwards in your progress in grief. You are simply allowing the human organism that is your body to take the space and time that it needs to grieve. And trust that your body, your mind, your heart, and your spirit will let you know when they are ready to see, to meet, and to greet the world again. Deep breath in here. And out. I'm so glad you joined me today. So that's all for this episode of Grief Seeds. Thank you so much for listening today. You can find additional grief support at shelbyforsythia.com or by following me on social media at Shelby Forsythia on Facebook and Instagram. If this podcast helped you in your life after loss, please leave a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And be sure to share Grief Seeds with a friend, because you never know what someone you love is going through. A huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for financially keeping this podcast on the air. If you'd like to support Grief Seeds on Patreon through a yearly or monthly pledge, you can do so at patreon.com slash shelbyforsythia. My Patreon supporters get access to behind-the-scenes content, including a once-a-month grief support call with me and five 90-minute workshops with topics decided by grievers themselves. Again, that website is patreon.com slash shelbyforsythia. Music for Grief Seeds is performed by Addie Goldstein. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I am so proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world, and I love you, because even through grief, we are growing.